George grew up in California and went to UC Berkeley for undergrad. Um, then he went over to Delaware to get a master's um, in applied e ecology, University of Delaware. And then he came back to California to UC Davis to do a PhD in J. Rosenheim's lab. Um, now George is at Minnesota, where he's a professor, and he works primarily on classical and conservation biological control, usually with parasitoid wasps. And today he'll be speaking on the specificity and process of biological control using aphid parasitoids. Thank you very much, Kate, for the um, introduction. Yeah, I think I'll need a little bit lower once the slides. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming at this odd time. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you guys heard, but um, I was snow snowed in, which is what I get, I guess, uh, for moving to the frigid north. You know? Uh, you, know, you know, it feels really warm to me out here, but Jay, Jay says it's like the coldest day of the year here, so that's just kind of how it, how it is. Um, but you know, it's a pleasure to come back to, I, I think it's been 10 or so years since I've been back here. Um, it's good to see some of the same faces here, but of course a lot of new ones too. Um, and it's a special, especially a pleasure um, um, to be able to talk about the work that I've been doing. So I, so I titled this um, Specificity in the Process of Biological Control. So I think you'll see um, what I mean by that. Um, I've been working mainly um, with soybeans uh, and with parasitoids of the soybean aphid. And I'm not going to talk a lot about what the soybean aphid is. I think all that sort of we need to know uh, for this discussion is that it's um, native to Asia, and it was first found in North America in um, the year 2000. It's basically spread throughout the so soybean growing areas in um, the US and Can Canada. And is now uh, the main agricultural pest for soy. And um, soy, soybean did, didn't used to be sprayed, but now it is. And so I basically embarked um, in 2001 on a classical biocontrol project. Um, um, myself and colleagues went to Asia um, to look for parasitic wasps or paras parasitoids that um, attack soybean aphid. And um, this is just sort of a limited list of some of the species that we found um, during these studies. Um, during these during these um, ex, ex, explorations, um, there are a number of species that are um, in the sub subfamily of Phidiaini within the family of Braconidae, which are are all um, aphid paras para parasitoids, and then also members of the genus Aph Aphelinus in the family Aph Aphelinidae, which are also all aphid paras parasitoids. I'm going to sort of talk about five of these species that we've brought in. Most of them, all of these have gone through quarantine post-specificity post test, test, testing. Um, and these five, I think, sort of all tell different stories. And they all talk about sort of the interaction between host specificity or host range and the process mm -hmm. of biological control, how we do biological control, what sorts of traits are either good or bad for biological control. So the first one um, is called Binodoxus com communis. This is sort of the first one that we um, push through the pipe pipeline. And, and I love this picture of this wasp because it shows how it stings. And um, a lot of people don't know um, that um, there are members of this group that have these claspers in the back of their ab abdomen that hold the aphid. So there are two claspers up here and two on there ventral side, and this is the ovipositor actually sticking the egg in. So there's a whole tribe of this sub subfamily that, that, that have this kind of oviposition behavior. That's not really the main point. Um, the point is that we did these um, um, host, host specificity studies uh, within quarantine. Basically, it's, it's, it's the safety testing that we now have to do in order to decide whether it makes sense to release a biological control agent. Um, these are, this is a kind of setup that we use. This, this is in quarantine. It, it's, it's just a growth chamber showing these things that we call tubes, which have plants inside. Um, each plant had 50 aphids in our case. And then we put a single mated wasp um, into this um, arena. Came back 24 hours later. 
um, saw who was parasitized and who wasn't, and got sort of data. And in, in this data set, we have 28 of species that we tested. Some of these were on same host plants, some of them were on different host plants. Um, 28 of the species, and here what I'm showing is um, the number of the number of um, adult female paras parasitoid offspring per one of those tubes. So, and here I've ranked um, the host use data. Um, in this case, soybean aphid, <coughs> aphis gly glycines is on top, so that's good. Um, but you can see there's this whole sort of range of other aphids. Some of them don't really appear to be hosts at all, or at least we, we don't get um, adult females. And then some of them have sort of intermediate levels. Um, is there a clicker, by the way? Is there a clicker? Is there a clicker? Is there a clicker? So one thing that we wanted to know is, um, in these cases, of relatively poor hosts. Why is that? Is it that um, they aren't getting eggs laid into them, or is it that there are eggs laid, but they aren't developing? <coughs> and, and I always tell my students that once you have a data set like this, it's, it's, it's like a gold mine, because every host has a different story. So for every host, there's a reason why it's not up here, why it's lower. And uh, we didn't figure out the reason for each species, but we did for some of them. And uh, I'm not going to go through the methods on everything that we did, because that would take a whole seminar, and I want to get to these other species too. Um, but we did obser observations, and then we also did serial di dissections of aphids that were stung, so that we were able to figure out whether sort of the limit was more of a behavioral or more phys physiological. So in a couple of species of aphids, um, eggs were never laid in those aphids, and we could tell through our observations that it was because the aphids were de defending themselves. They were kicking, spinning around, um, pushing off with their an antennae, doing all sorts of things, um, the result of which was an egg was never laid. So you know, in this case, we can say you know, the, the, the reason, or at least, you know, Really, all, all that we can say is that these, these aphids never got eggs in them. You know, they might have been good aphid hosts, um, and we tried to get eggs into some of those. It's a long story. Um, some of them, um, another four species, uh, were simply not de de detected by the wasp. So the wasp would walk over the aphid. You know, we had a proto protocol that, um, um, that um, the parasitoid's antennae had to touch the aphid. Um, for, for the aphid to fall into this cat category where it was not being detected. So um, the antenna touches the aphid, yet, um, yet the parasitoid makes no motion to sting. So there's probably some sort of crepsis going on where the parasitoid can't tell or it's just walked on and touched as an aphid. So these six aphid species never got eggs laid in them. Um, out of our initial set of 20 aphids, nine of them did get stung, so did get eggs laid. And um, in those uh, that were not soybean aphids, there's some level of physiological incom in in incompatibility. There's some reason um, that has to do with what's going on inside the body uh, for why they're uh, poor hosts. Um, two of them um, turn out to be host plant effects. So if you read this small print here, this is Aphis, Aphis asclepiatus, which is a milkweed feeding aphid, and this is Aphis nerei, also a milk, milkweed feeding aphid. When we raised these aphids on non-milkweed hosts, um, especially um, asclepiatus being way up here, so it's clearly sort of a host plant mediated factor. Um, with Aphis nerei, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, we couldn't actually rear it on a non-milkweed host plant, but we reared them on different species of milk milkweed, and uh, that, that made a difference. Um, in one of our aphid species, Aphis craxivora, a very poor host, 
It turned out that it harbors um, the endosymbiont Hamiltonella defensa, which uh, you might know as um, the same bacterial endo endosymbiont which the P. aphid has and confers re resistance um, to, um, to, to, to an aphidious herbi. So, and it's, it's sort of a long story. Um, the bacterium has a phage, and that phage produces a toxin which kills the eggs and or larva of the, of, of, of the parasitoid inside the aphid. So, in our um, initial study, you know, we just found this pattern. Uh, and I'm not sure on all the data, but the pattern was basically in our serial di dissections that the eggs were dying and that the larvae were dying too, which is the same pattern that, um, that um, you find for the P. aphid. Uh, we subsequently did some studies where we cured some of them and, and were able to prove that really Hamiltonella was the reason. So when we cure them, basically this line goes away up here again. So it's, it's, it's another case where we have some idea of why some of these hosts are suboptimal. Um, and some of these other ones, there's a severe male bias X ratio. So these are basically the tiny aphids. So um, in our, in our uh, behavioral assays, we always had them be the same size, but from our tube assays, uh, we, we got these male biosexuals from small aphids. So, so that's another limiting factor. <coughs> um, something that you may have noticed, you know, we can kind of go back here, actually. You can see that all of these almost are not these aphids, and all of these almost are not. So there's clearly some sort of phylogenetic um, uh, factor here. So just you know, another way that we can view these same data is you know instead of ranking them, we can get get um, get um, a phylogeny of the aphids, which we did, and then you can sort of map these host parasitoid traits onto that. And so, for this species, we basically find that um, the aphis glycines clade, so the soybean aphid clade, is where you get the highest levels of parasitism. This is just shown a little bit differently. <coughs> and so, there's a way that you can there's a way that you can um, assess the phylogenetic signal, and uh, we use a program called Phylocom to, to do this. There's other ways, and um, and we found that there was strong phylogenetic signal for the total number of mummies and the total number of adults. <coughs> but you can see that even though there is phylogenetic signal to these traits, there's still really interesting things, you know, like there's this species which is in this clade, but it does relatively poorly on that species. There are some of these that are sort of outliers that are relatively distantly related, but reasonably ill host. So even though they're signal, there's still interesting things going on that aren't uh, so tight. Um, but this is supposed to be about biocontrol, right? You know, we're supposed to be trying to determine whether we should release Linodoxus communis as a biological control agent of soybean aphid. All the stuff I just talked about doesn't really address that. Uh, what we need to do is think about what are um, the native non-target hosts. In our group of 20 aphids, there were actually only five that were native. Most of the aphids that we were working with were themselves introduced pests or just introduced non-pests. So these are the five non-targets. Two of them were not hosts. Two of them were relatively poor hosts. But one of them was actually a pretty good host. And this is called Aphis monardi. So this certainly gave us pause, you know. Um, we don't necessarily want to introduce a biological control agent that can have a negative effect on a native species, even if it's an aphid. Even the poor lowly aphids have a right to exist in, in, in their native ecosystems. So, so we wanted to look more closely at this one species, Aphis monardi. And I'm going to talk about some experiments that we did, but um, this one picture basically shows the whole story. So uh, the, 
the sole host plant of Aphis monarda is um, Monarda fistu fistulosa. It's mm -hmm. also called bee, bee balm. There's a bunch of common names for it. And it's a, it's a common native um, prairie plant in Minis Minis Minnesota and other areas. I, I, you know, do you have it around here? I don't, I don't remember it. Anyway. Um, and this is the aphid right here. You can see that it likes to feed down in these flower bracts. And you can also see those kinds by ants. Um, we did a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that we went out into the field, into these native prairie settings, and we found these flowers and we tabulated how many aphids were on the flowers and whether they were ant tended. And uh, the first thing that we noticed is that the aphids tend to aggregate on the flowers. They're not on the leaves. Um, all of our experiments in the lab were on leaves, on, on veg vegetative growth. Uh, it's very difficult in the green, greenhouse to grow these plants and to get them to bloom. So all of our experiments were on the leafy vegetative part of this plant, which seemed fine to us. But then we get into the field and we see, oh, the aphids aren't on the vegetative part. They're in the flower heads. So we did an experiment where we brought some flowers into the quarantine lab <coughs> and looked at um, parasitism by Bynodoxus communis on this non-target native aphid species. And we found that on the non-flowering vegetative growth, just as previously, we had a lot of mummies. But um, in, in, in the flowering uh, rats, you know, you know if, you, if you give the aphids flowers, They'll settle in the flowers, and the parasitoids basically won't be able to find them nearly as well, and they don't get stung. Uh, the second thing we noticed in the field was that um, pretty much all of the um, aphid colonies were tended by ants. Um, and in fact, um, colonies that were not tended by ants were very small, only three aphids. You know, I don't know if you even call that a colony. So you know they can only really live in colonies if they're tended by ants. So there are plenty of ants out there tending these aphids in prairie settings. And so we uh, brought an ant colony into our quarantine lab, and we used Lazius neonica, which was the most common ant that we found tending these. And we set up this kind of an arena. This is a box that has the ant colony that was dug up from the field. And then we just kind of con con connected um, our different um, arenas um, to the ant colonies in ways that we could compare plants that have ants, plants that don't. And this is on veg vegetative growth. And as previously, in cages without ants that have vegetative growth, you have plenty of mummies. But if you add the ants, much fewer. I think we all know what ants do with aphids, um, one of the things is that they pr pr protect aphids from natural enemies. And this shows up a little bit. You can see in this arena that this is a paras paras parasitoid, and she's actually about to sting. And this is an ant up here. I'm going to show a couple of pictures. You can see the ant moving down towards the parasitoid, and just grabs it. Probably brings it back to its nest to feed to its larvae. And we also saw, I don't believe I have a picture, but uh, we also saw a lot of the mummies were actually chewed, big hole in them. You know, the ant had just come up to the mummy and taken the pupa of the parasitoid out. Um, so based upon that information on the laboratory host range studies and the sort of ecological host range studies on that one non-target aphid species, we got a permit um, to release Spinodoxus communis in the field. And so we started to release it in 2007. And we did not get establishment, although um, we did find a few Bynodoxus just this last field season. But we still have to figure out whether it's Bynodoxus communis or the first record of a native North American Bynodoxus species in Minnesota. So, so it may have established. Um, even if so, it established at a low rate. 
with great dif dif difficulty. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this work, but we, we thought a lot about, well, why did it not establish or appear not to? And it does, it does appear that it, 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 it has trouble entering into di diapause um, in the fall, which is unexpected since it comes from a part of China that has a climate very similar to Minnesota. You know, it's hard to imagine how you could even have genetic variability for the ability to diapause in a place like that. But maybe it did. Um, there's a lot of integral inter predation on this thing. So in, in Minnesota, we have um, sources of integral predation that we did not see in Asia. So it might be sort of out of whack in that way. And we also found that there was female bias dis dispersal for these sites. Um, I'm not going to talk about these because it would take too, too, too long, and I want to get to these other species. But you know what I what I want to say for for this one is that we found that it had a relatively narrow host range, that um, ecological risk was low, so we did a re release, but the release didn't seem to work very well. Um, I'll next talk about a species uh, for which we still don't have a species name. So it's a it's a species of Lipoalexis, and we brought this into the quarantine lab. And we did the same exact kind of studies that I showed, showed you, um, but it had a much broader host range, um, first, first of all. And second of all, Aphis glycines wasn't even the best host. Um, so we ran our phylocom analysis on this, and there is no phylogenetic signal to these host parasitoid traits, um, which is sort of the hallmark of a generalist. Um, also, there's a host plant com component here. Um, the five best hosts so, uh, are all grain aphids. So the common names here are bird cherry oat aphid, corn leaf aphid, green bug, in English grain aphid, and Russian wheat aphid. And when we do um, a test of phylogenetic signal on plants, it's significant. But when we do a test of phylogenetic signal on aphids, it's not. So basically what Lipolexis is, is a specialist on grain aphids, and it kind of does OK on the others. Um, in terms of, is this going to be a promising agent uh, for soybean aphid biological control, not really. So, um, so biological control using this species, um, as I just said, it had a broad list of the preference for grain aphids. So we didn't even uh, pr pursue a permit for this one. Third species, Lysophletus orientalis. Um, this is one of our three species in this whole sort of odyssey um, that's, that's a new species of science. So this, this name uh, is, is one that Peter Sari gave, you know, it's, you know, as part of his work. Um, I'll show you in a second that um, the host specificity is pretty, pretty high. This is also um, a rare member of this group that's the Philidicus, so there, there are no males here which from a biocontrol standpoint we kind of like. And uh, we also, in the colonies, found a lot of winged mummies. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of a winged mummy in a second. What that basically means is that uh, the parasitoids will lay an egg into an aphid, um, and then uh, the aphid will sprout wings, fly away, or you know, it could even be an adult aphid. So it, it could be a means by which um, the parasitoid is dispersed within the body of the aphid. So we kind of like that. So there are these two factors, actually these three, which made it seem like a pretty promising agent. Um, this is just a look at the host range. I don't have this sort of phylogenetically work, worked out yet. But it's, it's a relatively narrow host range, basically on aphids. <coughs> Since there's only one sex, all we care about 
is the mummies and then the adults. And here's a picture of a winged mummy. Um, but this story has a twist to it. <laughs> it has a, uh, you know, what, what we think is a pretty interesting twist. And one thing that we were doing with all these species, or a lot of them, were what we call multi-generational cage studies. So the, these are the kinds of cages that we used in quarantine. Ba basically what we did is that we would seed the cages with six soy plants. <clears throat> Each of those plants had a certain number of aphids and a certain number of pairs of bears, so it was 50 aphids per plant and then one uh, female per plant. And then we let them go. And every half week, we'd take out one plant, and we'd put in a new plant, but that new plant wouldn't have aphids on it. And so, and this would go on for a couple of months. So that we're basically seeing the population di dynamics that all started from that initial group. And for Bindoxus communis, and for some of our other species, this is what we saw. So what I'm showing here, this, so this, these are the weeks of the experiment of, of these multi-generational lab uh, cage studies. What I'm showing up here is a cage that doesn't have any parasitoids in it, so um, um, a uh, con control cage. So the aphids get to about 1,000 or more per plant, which is basically their, their carrying capacity. Uh, plants are killed at this state, you know, at this level, basically. Um, and this line, though, is the number of aphids in cages that have binodoxus communis in them, and these are the mummies. So you can see that when parasitoids are in the cages, um, the aphids kind of stay pretty high for a while, not very high, then they go to extinction as, as do the paras par parasitoids. So that's, that's exactly what we want to see, that's fine. Um, this is part of the reason that we thought this would be a promising agent. <coughs> So we did the same thing with Lysophlegus orientalis, and what we saw was kind of shocking. So first of all, so here the, here the control line is the same, but this other line that's really in, intertwined with the con control cage line is the line, is, are the aphids that have Lysophlegus orientalis in the cage. You can see that there's little that, that there's no su suppression going on at all. And it's not that the parasitoids didn't establish. They're there, and they're gaining a number. But they're not controlling the aphids at all. <laughs> I mean, they're eating them, they're killing them, but it's not leading to lower population levels. So we looked at some other things, too. One is um, the host stage preference. And there's already a little bit of a clue, because I previously said that we saw winged mummies, which suggests that later stages are stung. And um, indeed, so this is a comparison of Vinodoxus communis are these dark bars, and Lysophlegus are these light bars. These are the aphid stages, and this is sort of a preference, a relative preference for that stage. So for Vinodoxus, you can see that there's a preference for the younger stages. And they don't, they don't really sting these, you know, for, well, fourth they still do, but, but, but not these uh, later stages um, as much as the earlier, oh, I can say it here, as, as much as the earlier ones. Whereas Lysophlegus will basically sting any stage. So, you know, including these stages that Vinodoxus does not like. Um, in addition, what we found <coughs> was that when these later stages are stung, actually not only by Lysophlegus, but also by Binet, Binet Um those aphids are still able to reproduce, which makes sense. Like, you know, think of, you know, an adult aphid being stung. Um, these pairs of parasitoids are what we call coinobionts. So that means that the host doesn't immediately die when it's stung. It keeps feeding. Um, you know, if it keeps growing and it keeps re re reproducing. So these stages here, not the thirds. So the thirds will die prior to mummifying. 
But these later stages, if they're stung by Lysiplinus or Orientalis, will spit out six to ten nymphs, and then they'll die and mummify. You see what I mean? Um, this actually isn't, you know, the first time that this has been shown, but there aren't many pairs of parasitoids that sting these later stages. Mainly aphid parasitoids like these younger. Um, so this could be contributing um, to the non-suppression. You know, if you're stinging aphids and they're still re reproducing, you're not killing them in the same way. Now, I should mention, though, that un unstung nymphs will pr 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 produce, I mean, unstung aphids will pr produce about 10 times as many. So just by itself, this, this isn't going to get you to complete non-suppression. Um, something else, though, is that we followed those nymphs, so those six to ten nymphs, and uh, we looked at their fecundity versus regular old nymphs, or aphids. And um, so these here are the offspring of stung aphids, and you can see that um, they have a higher fecundity than unstung or regular old aphids. So these are the offspring of these stung aphids. Those six to 10 that they squirt out prior to dying have a higher fitness. <coughs> um, this does not translate into the second generation, which we needed to do because it could have been that these guys, the offspring of the stung aphids, were more fecund but they're um, pr pr producing smaller or lower quality offspring. That's not the case because in the second generation, there's no difference. So these guys, stung aphids, are laying nymphs that are simply more fit. And we actually have a theory for why that is. We pretty much feel like we have the mechanism nailed, nailed down, but I, I, I don't want to run, run out of time, so I'm going to go on. So, but we think that this might also contribute to the non-suppression. We have modeled this, um, and it doesn't get you all the way. So it, 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 it can't actually explain all of the non-suppression that we found. So there's still more to learn, um, but it, it gets you some of the way there. So for biological control using Lysiflebus orientalis, <coughs> so what have we done? With this. So, as, as I said, this is a promising species from the standpoint of safe, safety. Pretty narrow host range, and then it has some of these traits which we like. But we did these experiments, and we found um, that there's some kind of compensation on the part of the aphids when they're stung, such that their offspring have higher fitness. Um, there's no su suppression in these cages, so we just decided, um, you know, at least for now, not to go forward uh, with trying to re release this. You know, it, it, it might be a sort of very interesting case of a parasitoid making an aphid a worse pest than it was, or, or at least not having an effect on it. So, you know, at least for, for, for now, uh, we've, we put the brakes on this one. Oh, this slide didn't come out very pretty. Uh, but we're on to the fourth species now, and we're now moving into uh, um, a different taxonomic group of aphid paras parasitoids, um, members of the genus Aphelinus. So, um, I'd like to tell you about uh, Aphelinus certus first. And um, we did host range test on this very broad. Basically every single aphid that we gave it, except Russian wheat aphid, who knows why, it's a great host. So, you know, we just said, okay, this is one of those that's a generalist and we don't want um, to go further with this. You know, we didn't think about it very, very much. But then, Starting in 2005, we started to see it in the field. So it basically became introduced on its own. Don't blame me. <laughs> and um, 
So it was it was first found. Let's see what I say in this slide. So it was first found in Pennsylvania, and then it was found in Canada. And if you talk to people studying soybean aphid in Ontario and Quebec, they'll tell you that this thing single-handedly controlling soybean aphid. <laughs> so it's like a natural experiment. And um, so of course, you know, we were curious about whether it would get to Minnesota. Uh, it's been since found um, in K Kentucky, too. But we found it first in Minnesota in the summer of 2011. And um, in 2012, um, my, my student Joe, Joe Hazer um, did a survey of the state and basically found it in all of these places where there's a yellow dot. So it has sort of spread throughout the state. Um, this is 2012. Um, and I, and I want to share with you some studies that he did. Um, since it's a generalist, we were thinking about sort of a parent competition scenarios where maybe it's using other aphid species, maybe earlier in the year, maybe at the same time, um, and soybean aphid. And um, one of and, and then the question is, um, does that basically allow it to establish? Does that lead to greater suppression on soybean? One of the most obvious groups of other hosts of something like aphylinosaurus are the grain aphids. So when Joe did his survey, he found fields, um, soy, soy fields that were either next to wheat fields or other soy fields. And um, this is actually a wheat field that's been harvested. He was timing his surveys when soybean aphids would be at their peak, which was actually uh, when wheat is already harvested. And so, you know, he was curious whether, whether there's this kind of a link where sites that had had wheat have more aphylinosaurus on soy. And uh, just to show you some of our beautiful landscapes in Minnesota and um, how he was able to do this study, which is a natural study. Um, you know, it's 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 so flat, and and uh, you know the landscape is basically corn and soybeans with some wheat sort of sprinkled in. So it was easy for him to find these com these uh, com comparison fields, paired sites that look basically identical. You know, with with the exception of the treatment that he wanted, mm -hmm. which was you know adjacent to wheat or adjacent to soy. So this is a site where you know, he would sample this soy, soy, soybean field and mark it as being next to a wheat field. And then here's a site that's soy next to soy. And they're just so similar. <laughs> the road is the same, the tree, it's just, it's just, so it's a nice study, I think, you know, in terms of getting good pairs. And he did find um, that there was a higher density of aphylinus certus per plant adjacent to wheat versus on adjacent to soy. It's not a huge data set, and in fact, he did an experiment the following summer. Maybe some of you guys went to ESA, saw his talk, where, where he tested this in an experimental setting, and he could not replicate these results, so we're not sure. But I chose to show the cool ones rather than the negative data. But um, still, I think, um, it makes sense to think of sort of a temporal apparent comp competition s s scenario. Like, you know, we like to call it the ghost of apparent competition past, where you have um, wheat as an earlier crop uh, that has grain aphids that can um, harbor aphylinus certus, and then those move on to soy. <coughs> So what about biological control using aphylinus service? This is really unintended classical biological control. Nobody re released this thing. It's, it's basically an um, invasive species. Um, it's very promising from an efficacy standpoint. But I think that the risk to non-target aphids is really high. And um, I pr predict that we're going to see negative cons cons consequences on native <coughs> aphids. <coughs> Lastly, that's not supposed to say six, it's 
supposed to say five, there's only five. Um, I'd like you to meet Aphelinus glycinus. So this is one of our three species that's new to science too. Um, Keith, Keith Hopper, who maybe many of you know, um, is, is my very close co collaborator on this work, and, and he worked on both this one and um, the, um, on the host range studies for Aphelinus ser service. So um, he just described this species as, 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 as a new species, found it has an extremely narrow host range. This truly is specialist of soybean aphid and coffee aphid. It, it really does very well on just those two species that we've looked at. Um, there's some other traits that we looked at. Remember for binodoxis, we were worried about the diapause issue. Um, this one is very easy to get it to go into di diapause using um, fall photo period, so we like that. So after a long time, because we had to put a name on it in order to get a permit for it, um, you know, we, we had the data showing it was safe, you know, way before we had the name, and you can't get a permit for something that doesn't have a name. Um, but we did get a permit as of October 2012, and we started re releases this year. So this is just a uh, picture of one of our sites. This is the canisters that we use. So um, we're starting to release this. Uh, we have some data on the interaction between this and Aphelinus certus, in case you were wondering. Uh, and I have some slides on that, but I, don't, I didn't put it in this talk, because I know I'm running up against the time clock. Uh, really, this. This one's just getting started. Um, I personally view it as a biological control agent of soybean aphid, but also as a biological control agent of aphelinus certus via the process of competition. I don't like that aphelinus certus is here. I don't, I don't like the damage it's likely to have on native aphids. And we might be able to use aphelinus glycinus to limit that damage. So to summarize, I'm going to talk about five paras parasitoid species. Uh, Binodoxus communis, which is a specialist, and we did release it, but it seems like it didn't establish or so, not very well. Um, Lipolexis was a generalist, and um, um, soy, soybean aphid wasn't even its uh, best host, so we did not uh, pr pursue release on this one. Lysophlegus orientalis was a specialist, had some promising traits, but this bizarre novel compensation story that uh, caused us pause. Aphelinus certus, a generalist that we did not want to release, but it came on its own. And then Aphelinus glycinus, um, a specialist um, that we're starting to work with in the field now. And I'd like to thank the people that work with me. Um, each species had sort of a group of students or, students or postdocs that worked on it. And these are my funding sources. And I think it's almost 5 o'clock, so I'd better stop. And I'd like to thank you for your um, attention. There are questions that I'd be glad to. Yes. So, so I have a question about um, uh, the permitting process. So you showed that for Binodoxis and Lysiflebus, there's they attack pretty much every aphis species that you looked at. In other words, how likely is it that that some of the studies um, done in this kind of a system are missing some aphid species that are might be that might be even a better host or how and, and how does that work with, with the permitting system? Are you required to sample extensively those species or is it something that you don't really have to do? Yeah. Well um, aphis is a big genus. It's it's the biggest genus in the aphidity. It has about four hundred species so Yes, you know, we, we certainly would have missed some native species. So our, our sampling of native species comes from uh, going into prairies and finding 
you know, the native aphid species that we can find. Some of those were aphids and some of them were not. So I think, um, you know, it's the, it's the kind of thing where sort of logistics kind of comes into play a little bit because uh, if you really are required um, to sample every, every native species out there, including really rare ones, then you basically can't do this kind of work. You know, at the same time, um, you know, the soybean crop is being sprayed with broad, broad spectrum, broad spectrum and insecticide. So there's a little bit of not only risk assessment, but risk analysis where you're thinking about the risks of doing, of doing biological control versus the risks of not doing it. Um, and we're always a little bit in the middle there. So, um, yeah, you know, that that answer your question. Okay. Mike? I'm wondering, is harmonia in this system? Yeah. yeah. So when I said intra-gill intra predation, yeah. that's basically what it is. So har har harmonia in the system is out of whack. There's um, way more here in North America than we see when we go to Asia. And so the intragill intra predation by that species is really high. You know, it might be so high um, that it's really difficult for these guys to establish. One thing that we did show, though, is that um, har harmonia likes high densities of aphids. So there's less intragill intra predation at low densities of aphids. So as far as establishment, you know, we sort of have um, a theory that it's better to establish the parasitoids at lower aphid, aphid and, and cities. But yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's a huge issue. But you know, I also think of um, classical biological control of soybean aphid being classical biological control of har harmonia. So it's clear that har, har, so so for those of you that don't, don't know, har, har, harmonia ax, axiritis is um, the mul multicolored Asian lady beetle, and it's a coccinella that's considered to be highly invasive, and is basically being implicated for um, you know the de decline of native lady lady beetles, and um, and it's it's. Its numbers ramped up really <coughs> high once soybean aphid was um, <coughs> was sort of was um, introduced. So it's pretty clear that if soybean aphid levels go down, uh, you know, it's not like har harmonia will go locally extinct, but but its numbers will, will go down too. So if we can um, achieve classical biological control of soybean aphid using these paras paras parasitoids that should have a negative effect on the invasive har harmonia too. That's something that we'll never know. Hugh, yeah. yeah. Presumably there are also uh, uh, negative parasitoids, right? Right, right. So that, that very first graph that you showed, supposing you have been using a negative parasitoid, how would that have worked? So, um, so the first graph I showed, you mean for the host yeah, range? You, you had your, your soybean aphid was, was the most parasitized by your introduced parasite. Yeah, yeah. Right? Supposing you had a native, done exactly the same experiment yeah. using a native parasite. Yeah, right? yeah, so, so we have done that. So the, so the most common native species in our area that, that, um, that, um, that um, attacks soybean aphid is Lysophagus testacipes. Which you also get here on uh, mm -hmm. cotton aphid, right? and it's sort of moved into the soybean system uh, at a frust frustratingly slow pace. You know, it does pretty well on soybean aphid, um, not better than its other hosts. You know, it it does great on aphis marii. It does great on. It's a it, it, it's a very broad generalist, um, and. Soybean aphid is sort of middling, so, uh, and you know, when we do phy phylogenetic signal studies of that for our host range, there's, there's none, you know, it's a gen generalist. So that one, um, it's, it's really not any, uh, it's, it ha hasn't had a real impact as clear on so soybean aphid numbers, and it's sort of a minor player. 
and I don't think there's a way to conserve but it. That's in the last, the soybean aphid came in 10 years ago, is that right? Yeah, 15 okay. years ago. Is there yeah. any indication that it's evolving yeah. as a better character? Yeah, it's like we we think it is, and then it, like you know there'll be some years where where it does better than previous years. So I think, oh, well, that's happening. Um, but then the following years it doesn't. So I think that you know its di dynamics are very much tied to other aphids. So it's very well known um, as as um, a green green bug parasitoid in places like Oklahoma. And, and I think it's tied to things like green, green bug movement on wind currents from the south to the north. And it seems to be tied to aphis nerii, the milk, the, the milk, milkweed aphis, you know. Um, so I think there's sort of outside forces. Um, you know, this thing, there's, there's so much gene, gene flow going on between lysophlebus that attack certain hosts and other hosts that I don't think it, that it would evolve to be a specialist so I mean it could very quickly. Yeah. How long have you have the parasitoids been introduced and active in the field in these seasons that Oh, so Binodoxus was introduced in nineteen ninety seven. I I am sorry, in two thousand seven. Um A for my dessert? I am sorry. It over winter. Yeah, well we thought it didn't and it still might not have. So, you know, we did overwintering studies, and in those studies, it did not. And uh, a colleague of ours, Jacques, Jacques, Jacques Brodeur, did some diapause di di studies, and he showed, um, he did show that there's, you know, like way less than 1% did go into diapause, so there was some. I um, mean, our studies, it was none. But in his study, there were like one or two. Um, but very low. Um, so we thought that that was a major limiting factor, that it wasn't able to overwinter. Um, you know, it did come from a part of China, um, the Heilongjiang, Heilongjiang region in the, in the northeast. It's very cold. Um, <coughs> but we think, it, or we, we have thought that it didn't. And we found these three this last summer, which, you know, the, the, it's really difficult to distinguish the species of that gene, genus. But it's either a Binodoxus com communis or the first Minnesota record of a native bina Binodoxus. We just have to work through that. Do you have any idea of what it does in China? How it overwinters there? No, no. Um, I've actually gone there to look at the overwintering host. And um, so, you know, we do a, so soybean aphid has an overwintering host and a summer host. The overwintering host is buck, buckthorn, so uh, members of the genus Rhamnus. And so I have found parasitoids on Rhamnus in China, not that species. Um, but Rhamnus is an overwintering host for both soybean aphid and cotton aphid in China. And um, so it's tricky. Um, so, you know, we, we assume that it overwinters in the mummy stage. That's typical. And it might overwinter on on the overwintering host of soybean aphid or my overwinter on a different host. This is not clear. Okay. So I always wonder about how predictive the quarantine studies on parent <coughs> rate but host range are going to be for field host specificity. Um, so it seems like now you've got three species that vary in the level of specificity that you measured everything in the quarantine. They're out in the field now. Is there any, so do you think this is a potentially an opportunity to see just how predictive the quarantine data are to the natural conditions? Oh, definitely for aphelinus cervus. So we're trying to get a handle on what it's doing in the field. So we've now reared it from soybean aphid, virtuary oat aphid, and English grain aphid. So, you know, it is attacking the grain aphids. Um, it, uh, and for aphelinus glycinus, you know, that one's establish it, we'll, we'll be able to do it. Uh, Binodoxus communis, if it did establish, then maybe we will. You know, it's certainly possible that the host range and field is a lot narrower. That's sort of the common pattern. Um, but, you know, we like to sort of take a conservative approach and uh, consider that, that, that there's a risk to anything that, that, that um, can, can be attacked. 
Any other questions? Well, thanks a lot. Oh, Mike. Right. You, you mentioned you had a, a, a underlying theory for it, why the offspring would be Oh, yeah. Theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that underlying theory has to do with sort of the host parasitoid inter interaction, as it's known. So basically, once one of these aphid parasitoids attacks a host, a couple of things happen. First, there's a venom, and that that venom goes to the ovaries and it starts to um, to um, degrade um, the um, ovarian tissue and also. Um, the young oos, oos, oocytes. You know, the purpose of that is basically to get the nutrients away from the aphid offspring so that the parasitoid offspring has access. Um, that, oh, so, so, so that's the first thing that happens. Um, second thing that happens is that when the egg hashes, when the parasitoid egg hashes, there's a membrane around that that splits up into 32 cells called, called um, teratocytes. And these also migrate um, to the ovaries, and they tend to degrade the older eggs. And they also um, stimulate the primary endo endosymbionts, um, bucnera within aphids, um, to produce more, to produce a more um, amino acids than they otherwise would. So basically, what's happening is that there are nutrients um, shunted to the pairs, sh shunted from um, oos, o oocytes and ovarian tissue to the parasitoid larva through um, the aphid hem hemolymph. So, uh, you know, what, what we find, you know, what our basic theory is, is that those few aphid nymphs that make it um, are basically, bathed, uh, first of all, are free from comp competition because some of their siblings have died. So within the ovary. And second is that they're bathed in a nu nutrient bath, uh, which, is a more, which is more nutritious than it would other, otherwise be. So you know, we do find um, that um, the nymphs that are just about to be born, so within the ovaries, you know, we di di dissect aphids out. Those nymphs prior to being born are larger than regular nymphs from stung aphids. So it's sort of cons con consistent with them being free from com competition and or having more nu nutrients available during the development. Does that make sense? Yes? Um, yeah, so this may just, just be my, my sort of like ignorance of like what happens with that. But I'm, I'm a little bit confused with like, um, with um, Certus. So yeah. you were saying that you are releasing glycinus? Yeah? Yeah. Well, might that have the potential to move Certus from attacking grain to other native I think, you know, I think what's more likely, um, since soybean aphid is um, the, the dominant aphid, so nu numerically there's more soybean aphids and by biomass than any other aphids oh. in this region. So I think the risk to non-target aphids is basically like a spillover, you know, either within season or spilling over and establishing. I think the lower that that source is, the safer it would be to non-targets. That's my reasoning. You know, the scenario that you mentioned could happen too, I suppose, but I think, um, you know, you just have these huge blooms of aphids and you know, if you imagine, um, and you know, we're we're seeing in 2013. I didn't show the data, but you know, easily 50 aphelinus sorts per plant. And there's you know 150,000 soybean plants per acre, <laughs> and seven million acres. <laughs> so you know, if we can reduce that sort of inoculum towards native aphids, uh, you know, to, to me that seems like like the best chance to reduce risk from one of the targets, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't know, like, since it was single-handedly handling the problem in Canada, that maybe have it, it having some competition, like, you know, move them over to something else. I mean, since the one is a specialist in it, you know, I thought 
perhaps it would be quite effective also. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think what it, so, so we're, we're now doing these sort of comp competition studies uh -huh. or pitting, you yeah. know, then sort of against each other. Yeah. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have all the data yet. But I think what would happen is, so if Aphelinus glycinus outcompetes Sirtis on a sort of per field or per plant basis, it would just lead to lower densities of Sirtis in that area. Um, so less of a chance for them to move on to other, in, into other settings. Are the Canadians doing similar releases? Pardon? Are the Canadians doing similar releases to what you're doing? No, the Canadians have not jumped on board for any of these other releases. They were in, interested in binodoxis in the early days, but then they did those value costs. Can you speculate how Sirtis actually got here? Yeah. Yeah. Just well, you know, I do think it's interesting because it was found on the East Coast. So it, it clearly, or, you know, it seems that it wasn't part of the original introduction of soybean aphid, which was first found in um, you know, Wisconsin in 2000. So I think it's sort of a clue that there may have been a second introduction of soybean aphid to the East Coast a little bit later. Because it was first found in 2005 in Pennsylvania, and then found sort of in the general East Coast area. So you know, I think either that happened or it's been here much longer, maybe on a different aphid, maybe on brain aphids, and then we will notice it now to move on to soybean aphid, and it just happened to move on there first, or, you know, it was there first. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, George.